Okay, so here we are. We're starting out. This is the Bellowing Forest Dragon, uh, the Bellowing Forest Drake. Now, <clears throat> this was uh, the initial pencil drawing was done during the month of Dragonary and is one of uh, the 31 dragons that I created for that. And I wanted, this was one of the ones that I wanted to develop a little further. So, what I did here was I scanned in my pencil drawing and decided to work the value up in Photoshop. Um, I also had a few ideas about the, the drawing of the back arm and this front hand that I thought may change a little bit. And I just felt that the flexibility of the digital medium in this, in this particular case was uh, going to allow me to try a few different things out as I was as I was working on it rather than um, re redrawing a bunch of things in pencil at this point. So again, you know, I, I started with a fairly established drawing and I'd had some time to think about this guy a little bit. So basically, I'm uh, starting in with this thing and just putting in some basic form. And you can see that I, I add and I change around that back front arm also. And uh, that even undergo that and the in the front arm, uh, the the front front arm also undergoes some changes uh, as we as this guy develops. Now, I and as always, I'm flipping these things back and forth in Photoshop. That's one of the great uh, advantages. I feel like it, it really helps you see the drawing for what it is, um, being able to work on it in reverse, not just look at it in a mirror, but be able to actually work on it mirrored. Uh, I just find that to be a huge advantage. So at this point, you know, I'm just working on this guy and I'm trying to establish just basic form and things like that, trying to develop it beyond just the linear pencil drawing that I established uh, during Dragonary. Now, I start that, you know, obviously just by trying to focus on sort of um, an, uh, an over top kind of front light source. So he's throwing a shadow right underneath him that you can see um, his legs and his arms are, are throwing down on whatever that is underneath him, which at this point I hadn't really resolved that in my mind yet. It was, you know, he was a forest dragon, so it was probably going to be some kind of rocks or maybe a, 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 a tree trunk of some kind that was fallen or so something of that nature, obviously something foresty. So, um, you know, I, as, as I start to move through this guy, I get the underneath of the drawing in, but to give him, to pull him away from the background, I use a few Photoshop tricks like a multiplied layer from time to time. And that's just a way to give value to the whole subject without having to get in there and redraw all of the value structure that I've already established. It just essentially darkens everything down kind of equally. So the dark darks get a little darker and the highlights get a little darker too. Now, as you can see, I'm kind of, I flipped the thing on and off and I'm constantly looking back at, at the drawing that I had. Um, you know, here's, uh, there's times when I'll, I'll draw something and then realize, well, I just want to move it around. You know, it's not that I that I don't like the way a hand is drawn or something like that, but I just maybe have it in the in the wrong place, or I, I see a different position uh, that he could be in now that that he's a little more developed, and that happens here with that back that back front arm. As you can see, he gets it gets kind of chopped around, uh, and then you know placed where I ultimately like it a little better now. Once I did that, I, I did realize that that front hand looks a little small. So we deal with that here in a minute. But really, you know, this is sort of the value study that I'm going to use to paint this particular character by when I take this to oil. So I'm just working this in black and white now. Um, as I move it to the oil painting, I will do my usual sapia coloring of it. But it will still just be a value drawing. So I'm, so it really just gives me some simpler things to deal with. I'm not I'm not in a position to really deal with color yet, which is kind of nice. So I can just work on the form of the arm and the head and that little crest of bone and the spikes and different things like that that I'm that I'm focused on right now. And I figured I would deal. I was pretty sure I was going to go with some natural colors, meaning greens and browns 
and stuff like that because of his environment. But I was willing to let some of that kind of go until I got into the oil phase and uh, start glazing some color in and let that kind of determine where that really went ultimately. So you can see here now we, we finally get around to straightening out the, the hand a little bit. Uh, the hand just looking larger. It looks a lot more like a frog's hand to me now too. The, the anatomy uh, is based more on a frog, but just the size of it looks more correct with the backhand. This is a lot of just noodling, uh, you know, the little details and putting in some things. And again, you know, I, I will take it further with oil, but this is really a great, a great guide. And the thing I like, too, about Photoshop, you know, having uh, some of the detail on different layers is just that you can look at it, look at where you were a few minutes prior, and then look at where you're at now and decide, you know, what you want to keep and don't keep. That's something that's a little tougher to do when you're working in the real in the real world medium. And so, you know, we're getting pretty close to this thing being ready to have a background dropped in. But I just wanted to go over some of the some some of how this drawing developed uh, for the underpainting. Now here um, you can see that I've taken that black and white Photoshop uh, rendering of the of the of the figure himself, and I've put him into a background and uh, kept that all monochromatic, and then paint bucketed that uh, a brownish a sapia tone I, I refer to it as. Um, mounted that down to uh, printed that out on archival. Uh, paper in this case and then mounted that down to quarter inch masonite using matte medium and then of course it gets a few extra coats of matte medium over top to seal the drawing and you can even see around the edges here where I've gone in with some acrylic just to just to either patch some uh, maybe a white edge or something that showed up from the print or whatever um, but of course all that's going to get painted over as we move forward so once I get all of that dealt with, printed out, sealed down, and ready to go. We're at the stage we're at now, which is starting to lay in, you know, some of this background color. Now, I've mixed up a pretty, this, I, um, I've talked about Robert Bateman before. He's a naturalist painter. He's very photorealistic, but um, I always enjoyed his paintings, and it's, he's one of the guys that sort of inspired this, this series um, for me just because he takes what I feel are kind of like mundane subjects and designs them so well that he really comes up with interesting compositions. And for him, it's certain species of birds and things like that. So I, you know, I've tried to apply that to the dragons here in this Dragons of Nature series. But one of the things that he does a lot of times is keeps a very muted bracketed palette uh, for his background. It almost gives it like a foggy look or, a, you know, that kind of environment. So that's something that I wanted to do here. It's not something I've, I've done a lot of, and I, I thought this would be a great opportunity to have him pop forward against the, you know, the grays and the, and the more subtle kind of high key values um, in, the, in this sort of misty forest background. So at this point, um, again, as I've talked about many times, it's really just covering covering as much of the painting as I can at this point. There are some things in some of this information, uh, putting together uh, these background elements, you know, some of which can be a little photo bashed at times, especially in when it comes to things like clouds or tree textures. Um, I just feel like that can give you a good leaping off point, even though... I'm not really trying to render with that same amount of, of detail and information. You know, the, anytime I, I use any photography like that, most of the time I'm, I'm never trying to paint that much information. So the first thing really is just to paint everything down, so to speak, and get it, um, you know, organized so that it really starts to look more like a painting 
than than photography or and or anything else. It could also be the textures of the brushes in Photoshop or something like that. That just isn't something that that I need to carry through all the way to the finish. You know, it served its purpose as um, as sort of an informational stage during these development points in the painting, but now they can kind of go away. And you'll see what I mean here now, because now that I, I have this background covered and there's a little bit more of a subtlety to the color than what I think we picked up here in the video. But um, once I start working back on that background again, I let this session dry, but you'll see that I start to put in the negative spaces just using white and it's a, uh, it does produce a very high key background which is what i was going for um and it it just kind of lets me control the value in that way you know it, at this point everything is very high key on the palette i'm using this rock again uh as an example of you know it has some textures in it that are not things i would necessarily uh paint they, there's a little too much detail of course you could you could use that and take that further, but I, I like to paint some of that information out and that way I'm really ready to move forward and have it, you know, be an oil painting at this point rather than um, a collage or anything like that. Now, the the rocks here also, you know, there was some texture brush involved in Photoshop and you can see all the little kind of detail that I, I will block out a little bit as I go. I put a little bit of that back in, but I've also worked in uh, some elements that look uh, like a little a little stream or a little waterfall area. So I, I resolved that in Photoshop too, much like I did the drawing of the figure itself before I, before I brought it to the board. So I, I have that much established. And now you can see here what I was talking about a little earlier where I have the value and the structure of the main figure established well enough that I can just start to glaze some color over that drawing and it will hopefully inform my decisions going forward about what color I want to actually make this guy. And I was really going for a, a, something that would blend into the forest. You know, I wasn't looking for a, a shock value in the color, like a red or something like that, that we might do, you know, a high fantasy dragon. This guy, I really wanted him to sit in the environment. The value difference between how dark he is and how light the background is um, really is the thing that controls the view, you know, where you're where you're looking in this particular piece. And this is kind of, you know, this stage here is, is kind of uh, the ugly stage. You know, you've got a lot of things blocked in and, you know, nothing's finished at this point. Um, but it's a little bit of a keep the faith thing. Again, you know, we're, we're trying to get everything organized in this piece. So, for example, I, you know, I have this rock, which is this rock off to the left of him, which is a, like a middle ground element. It's I don't want it to be as dark as... The foreground but I don't want it to be as light as the background it's going to be kind of the one element that gives that really helps reinforce the depth in this piece by being a middle ground area and also will uh, help establish some of that green the green yellow color uh, in the middle ground palette you know there's going to be quite a bit of green in the figure itself but by the time you get to the background, it's really a lot of grays and, and real light blues and things like that. So there's not a lot of green in anything except the foreground. And just a few hints in that rock there that really tie the whole thing together. So now at this point, um, usually I would... I. I could go either way on this as far as having letting the background dry and painting in those edges. I'm kind of thinking that I have the background lighter tones fairly dry at this point, which is allowing me to go in and really um, sharpen up the edges, you know, the perimeter, so to speak, of this of the figure without it getting, you know, mixed into mixed into the whites of the background or the lighter tones in the background. And as you can see, kind of moving around, you know, I, um, 
uh, on him. Now, I, I, the glazes that are on the figure itself, you know, may be wet at this point. So I'm able to work into that wet into wet, which is great. So I'm able to get some blending in here. Now, again, you know, this is a little bit of a keep the faith period of the painting and just have to put in the time because there is quite a bit of little rendering and uh, scale textures and all of these spikes and things like that to deal with with this guy. So, you know, that's all stuff that we just have to kind of work our way through. And as I'm laying in these, in the, uh, you know, a lot of these areas I've blocked in some color, the green and some browns and things like that, just to just to give it a wet surface to paint in and give me some sense of the color. But I also saw the belly of this guy as having a whiter, a lighter color, which is um, pretty common in nature. But I thought that would really help kind of tie him to nature a little bit more. So while I'm working on it, all this, this is kind of the first pass and it's an opportunity to see how all of this is working together. And of course, some of those lights, I'm, I'm mixing uh, some of the colors of the palette, which are the environmental colors, into some of these things, which, are, which also helps it seem like it's all part of this environment. Now, working on this part underneath, you know, I, kept, I want to keep in mind that even though it is a lighter area on him, it's darker than the background. So it's not a white highlight. It's still a middle tone, a little bit warmer than the background, which helps pull him forward. But I didn't want to get, you know, obviously I don't want to get so white that it starts to compete or look odd with the background. It's still, you know, a shadow. It's still the underneath of this guy in the foreground. You can see there a lot of this, you know, I'm doing with uh, some fairly small filberts, uh, you know, my sort of go to things. I'm probably not using a round yet, but I you can see that I use that kind of that one filbert that's a little worn and it's, you know, I, it's clean and it's soft, but it doesn't hold a tip anymore. And I use it as kind of a blender uh, brush as I'm moving around on some of these pieces. So again, now. Um, while I have a lot of these colors mixed up, I'm still continuing on with the block in phase. So it really is just trying to get rid of all of the underpainting, you know, make sure everything's covered with paint, and then we kind of move forward from there. In some ways, you know, this is kind of the fun stage of the piece because a lot develops in front of your eyes, um, and it happens kind of quickly because you know, the real time and the rendering hasn't come yet. So, you know, you're covering the canvas kind of quickly and, you know, you see a lot of it happen. Now here again, you know, I have some colors on the palette that are in those rocks and in that background, these blues that uh, I'm starting to, to introduce here. The, ho the whole piece is really lit by a, an overcast light, an overcast gray light. There's no yellow sunlight in this piece. So the blues are important to kind of control. And even still, you know, we'll get into dealing with them when I put those little passages of water in there um, that will be, you know, different values of gray and blue. So again, I'm um, with the texture here, you know, I'm, I'm able to be a little more arty with the, with the approach on the rocks and apply a little more of a texture that the brush is giving me and some of that I may let show through, you know. Um. I've referred to plein air painters many times, and I, you know, there's a, a sort of a spontaneity to the look that I think they achieve that I think is something that, you know, I find uh, really nice and attractive about some of these things, especially when you're trying to create um, motion and things like water and stuff like that, that if you paint too much detail can start to look almost stiff. So um, with that in mind, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm letting some of the brushwork show through on, on a lot of these rocks and just leaving it alone. I'll let that dry and then I'll come back and, uh, you know, s s see what it needs as far as finish.
but you can see like at this point now we have most of the underpainting you know most of the underpainting that that were things that I really didn't want to have show all the way through to the final piece some of the some of the hard textures that were created or just even some of the patch that I had to do with the acrylics around the edge all of that now has been you know cleaned up so we're through all that and now we're really dealing with an oil painting here and it's about taking this um, you know this particular piece now to to finish and what do we need to do that and you know one of the things I think about as I'm looking at this because I haven't even started to render the front arm on this guy is that I want the you know the back arm and the back leg on him to really kind of fall back into silhouette um, it's something that you know uh, some painters do really well Frazetta always did it to great effect um, and I and I think it was something that I, I definitely consciously thought about here. But now that as I move on into this background, um, you can kind of see where I know I know that the background is dry now. I've laid the the initial lay in was done with a lot of thinner and liquid and stuff like that. So um, the set the sections that I'm doing this, the sittings that I'm doing, they're dry every time I come back to the piece. So at this point, that gray background. Is completely dry and what I'm coming in and doing is just pecking in these little negative spaces and mostly that's just believe it or not it's just white it doesn't achieve a true white on the piece because it's has a little bit of transparency to it um, but this was an interesting experiment to do this this way and again I think it definitely conveyed this this misty forest that I was looking for with this with this piece. You know, and I and again, it's not a it's not a portrait of any one piece of reference. I moved some things around and you know, I put elements where I wanted them to create the composition that I needed or that I liked. Um, and now it's just a matter of kind of getting in here and finishing pecking away at these de details so that it gives the impression of the texture that I'm looking for in the finish. And I really want, it really is a setup for the detail that I'll uh, put into the, the figure. And you can see there, I get a little, a little bit of a little goober in the, in the paint. Sometimes that dries, you scratch them out and it happens. That's just the nature of the beast. And the, you know the initial lay-in, of course, was done using some reference. Also, not just not just what was um, in there in the digital underpainting, but also some reference that was off to the side. And and there is at this point as well. I'm sure that there's something off to the side that I'm looking at to sort of get the essence of these little passages of light, these little groupings of shapes, and. Uh, you know, as I'm working. So, and it's not, it's not a matter of, of trying to copy them exactly. It's, it's really just a matter of trying to capture the essence of that environment or of that piece of reference. This is much lighter than the piece of reference that I had. This, I, I really misted this out a lot more than, than what the reference was, but it was still um, very, it was a very effective piece to have as a guide for this, for what I did here. And this is sort of one of those times where, you know, it takes a little while just to work around. And but after this, you know, for the most part, unless I change the shape of something on the main dragon, you know, this background area will be pretty done, you know, after this pass, after these negative spaces are put in. Now, this here, you know, at this point, again, here, everything's dry. And here what I'm doing, um, this is one of the key, uh, places where you can see that I'm just putting on clear liquid at this point you can see that it brings out the darks that are in the piece but as I work into this now I dust that all down so I don't have um, any big uh, you know gloops of stuff on there more more technical terms um, but so I basically have a, a clear layer of of medium down on the painting and now I'm going to work wet into wet but I'm going to work you know wet pigment into clear pigment almost you know so to speak so you can see where um, that's going to be an advantage in blending a lot of these things but it also 
make sure that everything that I do in this session is going to be dr completely dry by the next time I work on this thing. So it, it keeps the process moving along in that regard also. But at this point, you know, I'm laying on pretty opaque paint, you know, and I, and I can blend that out um, and things it can become more transparent. Um, but I'm I'm not I'm not loading it with liquid on, on the palette itself. You know, I have the liquid on the piece, but I'm not really using a lot of it on the palette, which also extends the life of the palettes themselves, because the, those colors that I have are not drying you know, every day. So in some cases like this, where I'll work on something over a period of a few sittings, I'm able to come back and use those same colors. So that's great. It saves a little time. It also means the colors are, you know, right on the money. So um, this again here, this is an area up that I know, you know, I'll go over a few times before I really get it to where I want it. And it also not only does it build sort of the detail, but it builds the opacity of the paint each time too. So um, a lot of times I'll tend to go in here, try to suggest texture and things like that, um, knowing that I'm going to hit it again. So at the end of the, uh, the the work on this on this pass, I'll dust things down, I'll, I'll blend them out a little bit and sort of set them up for the next the next um, pass on it. And now, in, you know, with this thing here, I have this sort of big bellowing like frog body. I sort of saw this guy as, you know, some, he, could, he could take in a lot of air and his body would expand. But in doing that, there's a lot of secondary forms that start to suggest themselves um, with this body. And it's kind of something that you need to lay in and sort of see what's there and then build it from there. Um, I've always found that to be an easier way than trying to force something that, you, you know, it, especially on something where you're not really sure exactly how it goes. And you'll see what I mean as we move a little further um, into that into that big back and, ch and chest area. Now, this is just, you know, it's a rendering exercise at this point. Um, and even though I think this is a filbert, I will switch over to a round at a certain point. And again, you know, this is just we're just in there noodling this kind of stuff um, there. You know, there may be a final layer of a few highlights or stuff like that. But I'm being I'm trying to be mindful of the direction of the brush and the way that, you know, the brush strokes kind of will start to suggest a scale texture or a hide type texture. So so I'm uh, trying to be mindful of the direction that I'm laying those things in. And you can see now as I start to work in around this area behind the, like over the shoulder there, there'll be little secondary rolls and, and little muscles that develop out of what is a one big, essentially a big, you know, uh, sphere is what the guy's, you know, whole chest and back is if you really break it down. But then beyond that, we're going to have some secondary and, and even tertiary form in here. And you can see where those little dusters, you know, I, I mean, the brushes, they really, um, they're always useful unless they're just clogged with paint. But, you know, even the brushes that don't keep their tip anymore can still be, can still serve some purpose. Now this is a fairly small filbert. I, I do have a few that are that are really small, and they're just I mean they're just about as uh, as good for doing the detail as the rounds. So I I do have a handful of those that I use from time to time. They're a great shaped brush for getting some detail, but also being able to carry quite a bit of paint for for the size that they are. And when I'm working on this too, I, I'm constantly looking at it at it in the mirror. I've I've said that before, but if you squint your eyes and look at this thing now, it will you'll start to see the development of little forms, and um, it's just something that I, I it, you can drive yourself crazy with this, but by looking at it in the mirror, it takes away that the real close up focus that it's a brush stroke. By looking at it from across the room a little bit. 
um, you know, you're able to, I at least feel like I'm able to see the form a little bit better and not get so caught up in, in all the little brush strokes. Now you can see there where, um, you know, we're starting to get some good form in that shoulder, you know, that, that whole uh, up, uh, arm there, um, the bicep and that tricep along with that back and the, and the colors coming along too. I see that I'm starting to add some yellow on the brush. I kept away from a real yellow green um, because again, we're trying to go with a more overcast look for this whole guy. But a little bit of a little bit of yellow in the green does it definitely helps add a little bit of life. And you can see even where some of the warmer brown tones that are in the spikes and things that are occurring in the underpainting, under the, you know, under the like what's laid in now on the leg, for example, in that forearm. You know, it, some of those warm brown tones give it a little bit of life compared to the greens and the and the and the bluer the blue green uh, highlights that are on these on these areas. So, it, and at this point too, like as I start to work on the leg, now I have the palette fairly well established on this guy. And that's, so that's something that I'm not really fighting anymore. I, I did like the green. Um, initially, I think I, I was kind of thinking about going with a darker patch down the back. And it's, I laid it in in a darker brown and, and probably even used a little like raw cyan or uh, raw umber, which is kind of a greenish brown. But now that now that I'm this far with it, I, I've uh, committed to him being this kind of greenish color. And then this is just a little more noodling here, you know, where, as I work in, work in some of the details around the muscles of the leg and the knee and all that kind of thing. Now the leg, you know, I've done, I, I don't know why, but legs I don't seem to have as much trouble with as some other areas. They always seem to be something that I'm, I'm able to draw um, pretty well. So they generally don't take me as many passes for some reason. I'm not sure why that is. And uh, of course, as always, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and I'd be happy to try and answer them. Thank you for listening. And if you've gotten this far, please consider joining my Patreon if you haven't already. There are three options in joining my Patreon. The Red Drake tier, which has exclusive Patreon supporter-only content. The Silver Wavern tier, which has exclusive content as well as an art print of that month's dragon art. And the Gold Dragon tier, which includes video critiques of your work. I hope you'll join this Dragon Lovers community where I'll be sharing many insightful tips to hopefully improve your dragon art making abilities. Thank you again. We'll see you next time.